with me tonight, if you would, to the book of Genesis chapter 21. And as we uh, continue, uh, the last couple of weeks our pastor has been preaching on characters of the Bible. And we want to continue that thought here this evening. And uh, last week we talked about uh, Abraham. Tonight we want to look at Isaac and how he is the promised seed. Genesis chapter 21. And as with uh, uh all of our other lessons that we've had, the memory verse that we'd like for you to, to look at and, and place in your heart is Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. And we're going to look at this a little bit later on, so we're not going to touch on it now. But write it down and log it in your, in your heart. And through, through this lesson tonight, what we want to look at is we want to look at uh, a better understanding of what is involved in our salvation. Now, we, we see a lot of times that, that uh, we see comparisons in the Old Testament to Jesus Christ and the New Testament and the, that sort of a thing. And to, uh, tonight is no different with the story of Isaac. So what we want to do now is go to Genesis chapter 21 and verse number 1. We're going to start here. And as, as we get going, you're going to notice uh, the father-son relationship throughout this lesson. And what I want you to do is... Uh, Look how it parallels with God the Father and God the Son. Okay, that's what we want to look at. And again, we see a lot of aspects with the story of Isaac uh, dealing with our salvation. So now in Genesis chapter 21, verse number 1. And the Lord visited Sarah, as he said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he, has, as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, and set the time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son uh, that was born unto him, who Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God hath commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for uh, services here tonight, Father. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be open to your word. Father, that all these distractions will be placed aside. Father, we, we thank you for your salvation and the love that you have for us. For the sacrifice of, of Christ. Father, in His atoning blood, we pray that you might just be with us now as we open your word. In Christ's name, amen. You know, as we go on with this, I want you to understand that there was a promise made to Abraham. There was a promise made to Sarah. And God is very true with His promises. He will not and cannot break those promises that He makes. We see it here in verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 21. We see this, and the Lord visited Sarah as he, as he hath said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he, as he had spoken. We see now that the promise is made true. He promised him, if you go back quickly to Genesis chapter 17, in Genesis chapter 17, we see that this is where the promise was made in verse number 15. This is what, this is what God uh, told Abraham here. In verse number 15, God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is a ninety years old bear? Now verse number 19, and God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. Now I don't want to spend too long on this tonight, because last week a pastor talked about all this with Abraham. But now we see 
that there is a fulfillment of God's word. Now we see that, that uh, 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 the birth of Isaac, how it was promised. Now if you go all the way to the book of Matthew, uh, keep your finger here in Genesis, but go all the way to the book of Matthew quickly, please. And we're going to see again a fulfillment of God's word in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse number 22. Uh, we, we see another fulfillment of, of God's word. In verse 22, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as God with us. You say, so where's the fulfillment of God's word? Well, if, you, if you go all the way back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, you will see that this verse is there that on how a virgin shall be uh, bring forth a son and, and how they will call his name Emmanuel. So we see a fulfillment of God's word. You know, as all this is happening, we, we see in, in chapter 17 of the book of Genesis, we just read how God uh, told Abraham that Sarah was going to bear him a son. And we see that, that Abraham in his heart laughed. And we see how Sarah in her heart laughed because they were uh, past uh, uh, the time that they should be able to bear children. Now remember, up to this point, Sarah has not uh, bore a child for Abraham yet. And what I want you to understand here is that everything has a set time, and that set time is God's time. We, as Christians, we as individuals... We, we tend to go ahead or behind of what God has intended for us and we lose sight of what God is doing through us and for us because His timing is never wrong. As we read here in, in verse number 2 of Genesis chapter 21, For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. It wasn't before God had spoken to him. It wasn't after this. It wasn't before God wanted it. It wasn't after God wanted it. It wasn't when Abraham wanted it. It wasn't when Sarah wanted it. It was when God wanted it. And we as Christians, we need to look in our lives and we need to look at, at, in, in the mirror of God's word. We need to focus on what we're doing or is what we're doing, does it align with what God has said? Does it align with what God has uh, wants for us in his life is, is the timetable are we pushing God's timetable are we dragging behind God's timetable are we moving when we're supposed to or are we sitting when we're supposed to be moving are we running ahead of what God has planned for us or are we following it in his direct will we can go all the way to uh, Galatians chapter 4 Galatians chapter 4 again keeping your finger here in Genesis as we see here now Galatians chapter 4 in verse number 4, the Bible says this, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. So we see here that, that Christ was born at the due time of which the Father knew it needed to be. You know, in our finite minds, we can't understand the grasp of what is happening. We can't understand the, the grand scheme of things because we don't know what's happening here in the next couple minutes. We know what happened a couple minutes ago, but we don't know what's happening here in the next few minutes because we're not God. We can't understand. We don't know. But God, who is all-knowing, who is all-understanding, has His timetable planned out. And if we're following according to, thus saith the Lord, if we're following according to His, His will and His righteousness, we know that our life will be found according and, we, and what happens in our life, God uh, foreordained, He knows. And if we're walking in His will, then we can have faith knowing that we can trust Him in all things. Isaac's birth, as we see in verse number 6, brought joy. And Sarah said unto God, uh, and Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. Now remember in, in chapter 15, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 17, we see that, that Sarah had a laugh in her heart. She mocked. Abraham had a laugh in his heart. They mocked. And now we see that that mocking is gone in chapter 17. Now in, verse, in chapter uh, 21, we see that now that, that it brings joy. You know, same is true today. I can tell you exactly 
what I was doing when my two kids were born. One was at eight, about 8.20 in the morning, Tyson was. Aria was at 3.26 in the morning. On, both of them on a Tuesday morning. You know, as a first-time parent with Aria, I had a tremendous joy. I had a tremendous overwhelming happiness because God had granted me a baby. God gave me a baby. But you know, just because I've had one doesn't, doesn't uh, deplete the matter that, that when Tyson was born, I wasn't just as joyous. I wasn't, I wasn't any less happy. You know, it brings a joy. When you see somebody coming into the church with a new baby, you know, you, you see everybody flock to the baby. Babies bring a sense of innocence. Babies bring a sense of happiness. We need to have this joy in our heart. In Luke chapter 2, verse 10, we know that, that it brought happiness. In Luke chapter 2, verse 10, we see the angel coming and declaring uh, a, a message. In verse number 10, Luke chapter 2, And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And let me tell you, I am still uh, joyful this day that Christ Jesus was born because it was with his miraculous birth. It was with his sinless life. It was with his sacrificial death that we can have eternal life. It was with him rising three days after the grave, not having uh, power, uh, 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 having power over death in the grave. That gives us eternal life. As we move on, we see Isaac growing up now. Now remember, we're looking at Isaac, the promised seed. Well, as, as Isaac grows up now in chapter 22, we see a testing of Abraham. And, and we're going to talk about this here in just a second. But remember this. Abraham, when he left the earth of the Chaldees, did not know God. He by faith willingly followed a God that, that he had not known. He wasn't raised knowing the all-powerful God or believing in the all-powerful God. But here in verse uh, number 20, uh, chapter 22, now, now Abraham has followed uh, God to this point. Him and his wife, they, they're, they're following God. They're doing as they should. And now as Isaac is growing up, we see a testing come in, in in verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And Abraham said unto him, uh, Behold, here am I. Now the tempt that, that we're looking here in verse 1 actually refers to testing. Okay, This tempting is actually a testing because we know in the New Testament that, that the Word of God says that God cannot tempt mankind. He will not tempt mankind. He will not tempt you away from His will. He will not tempt you away from His desires, from the holiness. But you know, for us, as we're being tested, we need to make sure that God, that God is first and foremost in our life. We need to understand that if we're walking through this testing, it is to try our faith. It is to grow our faith. It is to mold our faith and our trust in our God. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we know that God must have first place in our life. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33, and I encourage you uh, here tonight, if God is not first place in your life, stop what you're doing. Let God be first place in your life. What is it in your life that is so important that God does not have preeminence in your life? What sin is so uh, uh, attractive that you place God number two, three, or even further down on the list? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Bible says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So God will put us to a test to reveal if our love for Him is genuine. You know, how many times do you as a, as a loved one often wonder, I wonder if so-and-so really loves me. I wonder if so-and-so really cares for me. You know, we could say, uh, I love you all day long, but it takes, it takes that of, of showing your love to prove it from time to time. 
You know, I can tell my wife all day long I love her, but every once in a while I need to prove it to her. Every once in a while I'll, I'll go out and I'll, I'll get her something just because I love her. You know, we can say with our, with our speech and our mouth that we love God. We can say with our, with our mouth that we're a servant of God, we're a child of God, we're, we're doing that which we're supposed to be doing. But you know, sometimes we need to put action to it. Let's take that back a minute. Not sometimes, all the time, we need to put action to it. God said He loved us. And he does love us. He put action to that love. God the Father sent his son. God the Son became that sacrifice. They had action with that love. Proven that love. We see here back in Genesis chapter 22 that, that Abraham has a prompt uh, response. And if God asks us to do something, we need to right now Stop what we're doing and do what God is asking us to do. We need to have a prompt obedience just as Abraham did. As we see here in uh, Genesis chapter 22, uh, verse number 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God hath told him. So now we see, we see that that he didn't, he didn't waste any time. He didn't lag. He didn't say, okay, God, I'll do this, but I'm going to do this in my time. Okay, God, I'll do this, but I'm going to do this in 30 minutes. God, give, give me another half a day to finish what I'm doing. No, 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 no. Abraham listened to God, and he rose up early and followed what God told him to do. Oh, that we respond hastily to the cause of Christ. We see Abraham's faith. We see Abraham's faith put to the test here. Quickly, keep your finger here. Quickly, go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Now, we know Hebrews chapter 11 as the faith chapter in the Word of God, but we see Abraham here. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse number uh, uh, 17 is where we want to go. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence he also received him in a figure. We see, we see the faith of Abraham here. We see that now he's offering his only son uh, uh, to God. We see, we see the sacrifice here. We see the offering now, what we want to look at here in Genesis chapter 22 is the typical teaching of this chapter. We're going to see a lot of comparisons between God the Father and Abraham, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and Isaac. Now, we're not putting Abraham and Isaac up on a pedestal by any means. No, no, no. But what we do see is we see the obedience. We see the for, from both Abraham and Isaac just as it's going to later on in biblical history of God the Father and Jesus Christ. So we see the offering of, of, of Isaac. Now we see in Genesis chapter uh, 22, verse number 2, we see Isaac is a type of Christ, and he is obedient unto death in, in, this, in this verse number 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon uh, one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So now here's Abraham. He's going, and God tells him to offer his only son Isaac as, as a sacrifice. Now me as a dad would break my heart. I would like to stand up here and tell you that that I would do it in a moment's notice. But praise God, He's not going to ask us to sacrifice our kids. Praise God, He's not going to ask us to, to sacrifice uh, uh, our loved ones for the cause of Christ. But we see now, now that Isaac is obedient. We also see a, 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 a comparison here in verse number 6, how Christ carried His cross. Christ carried the 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 cross that he's going to be crucified on, on his back, he carried it. We see now in verse number 6 of, of Genesis chapter 2, we see Isaac carrying the wood. 
And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went, both of them, together. Now, one thing I want you to remember here. Isaac has no idea what's happening. He knows that they're going to make an offering to the Lord. Abraham had taught him the, the laws of God. And he understood that the, what they were making the offering. He, at this time, did not know that he was the, the offering. He didn't know that he was the sacrifice. He is being obedient to his father here. He is being uh, obedient to God and doing what he's supposed to be doing. But now it's getting ready to be a step further. In verse number 9. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Here we have Isaac, probably a young man. We have Abraham, old. Remember, he was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Isaac could have taken Abraham. Isaac could have rebelled and done that which he wanted to do. But out of obedience out of obedience and out of love for his father, he obeyed. How would you like to get the news of you're carrying the wood up there, you're, you know, the altar's been built, you're on this mountain that God, God told your dad of, and the next thing you know, you say, well, where, where's, the, where's the sacrifice? Where's the, where's the lamb, dad? And he says, son, you're the sacrifice. I wonder how many of us today would tuck tail and run or how many of us would stand there and take what God has planned for us. Isaac was laid upon the wood. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, we, we, we see that as he is offering no resistance to Abraham, we see that, that we as Christians today, when Christ is asking us to do something that may seem hard, may seem overwhelming, we need to let go of ourself. We need to get our mind back in, in tune with God. We need to get our hearts back in tune with God. And when we go, we need to go at 100%. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him in the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Christ Jesus could have said at any time, I'm not going to lay down my life for these people who have voluntarily gone away from me. I created everything for them. Everything was perfect. They wouldn't mess it up. I'm not going to do it. But Christ didn't do that. He became that voluntary substitution of, of, of the just dying for the unjust. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18 uh, we see here it says, Therefore doth my Father love me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So we see that Christ willingly laid down his life. We see that Christ willingly stood there as he stood that mock trial. I'm not going to talk about it too long because pastors talked about it here the last couple of weeks on Jesus' path to the cross. We know all the, all the falsehoods that happened. We know that all the lies, the mockeries that took place. Yet Christ stood there willingly. We see, a, we see Abraham, a type of the father who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for his soul. In the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16, a verse we all know, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All this happened because God the Father loved us enough that he was willing to sacrifice his only son. Remember our memory verse we told you about earlier? Let's turn to it now in the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse number 32 The Bible says this, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, 
how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You say, well, you know, this is what I don't understand. All this is happening. God knows this is happening. Why does he put us through this? Well, remember earlier we talked about how, how God will test us to try our faith. Maybe not for God to know what he has in us because he knows our hearts. He knows, he knows what he has. But you know, sometimes we need to go through that testing to show what we have for our God. Where does our faith lie? What does our faith stand for? How much faith do we have in our God? You say, well, this testing I'm going through, well, maybe it's a testing for that trial. Maybe that trial is, is there to try your faith. Or is that trial there because you're willingly going against God? You say, I want to do this. I have this desire. And you go and you pursue it. And every time you go, a door shuts. And when it shuts, it doesn't just slowly close. Man, it slams hard. How long do we as Christians have to go and have to keep hitting our head against the wall, against that closed door to try to get it to open? If God closes that door, it doesn't open. Remember the ark in Noah? The Bible doesn't say that Noah went in and Noah shut the door. The Bible says that God shut the door. When, if God is shutting doors in our paths, quit trying to knock them down. If God is shutting doors in our way, quit trying to open them up. If the door is locked, you can't pick the lock. God has locked it. Instead, look and align your wills, your spiritual wills, so to speak, with the things of God. Get back in His will and, and, and look at what you're doing. See if it is what God wants because you never know. He's keeping you from something terribly bad down the road of what you know not. There's been times in our lives that, that we're, we're going and for some, for some reason we get caught up you know, at the store a little bit longer or we catch every red light in town and coming to find out that if we would have hit every green light or if we would have left a little bit earlier, there was a fatality wreck that who knows we could have been a part of. You see, God protects us. He watches over us every step that we take. But are we so spiritually blind that we can't see that what we're doing is not in line with God's will? How much faith do we have in our God? In Genesis chapter 22, verse number 13, we see now, we see now that Isaac is bound. He, he's laid on the wood. And now we see that God sends a substitute. God sends a substitute in verse 13 of Genesis chapter 22. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. You know, today, we as Christians deserve to die and have eternity in hell in the lake of fire. There's nothing, not, there's not a person out there that merits heaven. Yet we have a substitute. We have, we have, a, we have one that became the sacrifice for us. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says this in verse number 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. He became that, that sacrifice for us. Peter says that, that his stripes caused our healing. Our, 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 our soul is sanctified. Our soul is sealed. Our soul is saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, we again see Jesus Christ is our substitute. Bible says this, for he hath made him to be a sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ, the one who knew no sin, became that sacrifice for all of us that know sin because 
sin is what separates us from God, the sin of unbelief, until we accept Jesus Christ. But then after we get saved, we know we sin because we're not made perfect. Our soul is made perfect, but we still fight our mind. We still fight our flesh. Praise God for 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that we can confess our sins, and we know that He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins just as he was faithful and just to wash away our sins. Back in Genesis chapter uh, 22, we just read verse 13. We see the substitute there, but we also see something here towards the end of the chapter. We see a resurrection. Isaac coming from the place of death to the place of life. In, in verse here 13 again, And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the set of his son. Just as, just as we said a while ago, how, how death and, and hell and the grave could not hold the power of Jesus. Just here again we see a resurrection. Hebrews chapter 11. My last few verses. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 17, we read these earlier, but let's go back to it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he hath received him in a figure. Now, understand this. God promised Abraham that he'd be the father of many nations. He promised that through Isaac, his seed would, would, would it be multiplied. And now God's asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Knowing all this, Abraham still went through, and I believe, true-hearted, full heart, I believe wholeheartedly that Abraham believed that had God wanted Isaac sacrificed, had it gone through that Isaac was sacrificed, I truly believe Abraham in his heart knew that God could raise him from the dead. Because God made him a promise. And we see up to this point, as, as Pastor talked with Abraham last week, that a promise with Abraham had not been broken. Abraham had no reason not to believe God. Let me ask you, how many of you that are saved here tonight, listening, how many of us have enough faith in God to walk where it seems as though we're going to walk into troubles and trials. Now remember, we told you that God cannot tempt us a will from His way. God will not draw us away from His will. Is your faith strong enough in God that as you're walking through these trials, no matter what it may be, you know that at the end of the trial, God is already there and already has the victory for you? We know that with the, with the temptation, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that those temptations, God's already got a way of escape with that temptation. Do you in your faith, as a child of God, you had enough faith to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? You had enough faith to know that God would save you. Do you have enough faith to know that God will get you through the trial that you're going through? Do you have enough faith knowing that God has the victory. Do you have enough faith to be like Isaac? Do you have enough faith to be bound in continual service? Here we are, our buildings are closed. The doors are locked. How's your service? How's your love? Is it wavering? Or is it becoming more sure? We're hoping and we're praying May 1st we get to open the doors. Will you come in with a faith full and running over? 
or are you coming in defeated and, and, and devastated for what's happened? Sure, this has been trying. Sure, this has been troublesome. But you know, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. For all the problems out there, our God is greater. For all the troubles out there, our God is greater. For all the sicknesses and pains, our God is greater. Let me ask you, where's your faith? Maybe you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior. Let me tell you tonight that Christ was that sacrifice. He freely bore upon His body your sin. So you could have eternal life. So you could have a home in heaven. Will you accept Christ as your Savior? Will you, will you follow the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac? Will you find that fellowship? And then after you accept Christ as your Savior, will you follow Him? Will your faith ever grow so you can see victories won through Christ Jesus? Isaac, that promised seed, passed from death to life. Obedience. Oh, what great examples. Let's pray.